This is going to be about the story of Naaman, the general of Aram, the Armenian army, and his, uh, I guess, sort of conversion or his his uh, encounter with the prophet and the whole story. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Good to go. Yes. All right. So here we go. Page 72 in the book. Naaman was the name of uh, Naaman was the name of a general in the Armenian army during the first temple period when the Jewish people were divided into two kingdoms, the kingdom of Judea and the kingdom of Israel. All right. Um, I think just about everybody here is quite familiar with the Hebrew Bible. So I don't have to tell you, you all know about the, the two different uh, kingdoms of Israel and Judea. And um, Naaman was a general of the Armenian army, which was an enemy of Israel. So it's interesting. So how does he come to have a relationship with, uh, with Israel and with its prophets? Let's find out. Naaman was a great man in the eyes of his people, the Armenians. Besides being a general and a great warrior, Naaman was a close and trusted aide of the king of Aram. But Naaman's life was far from perfect. He was afflicted with leprosy. So politically, he was up there. Politically, he was a general. He was a close aide to the king of, of Aram. Uh, but he was ill, very sick. He was sick with leprosy. It, I, you know, what I was wondering is how was he... How was it that he was a general, went out to war and was and had leprosy? Um, you know, what kind of leprosy are we talking about? I mean, it seems interesting that that's the case because that, that could be debilitating. Um, but anyway, this is what they're telling us. I don't know if it's if it's a form of leprosy that was, that's familiar scientifically, medically, or it was or it was just more similar to something that was that was more topical on the skin alone. Um, anyway, but in many ways, this is the case. This was the story. He was a, he was a powerful leader and a, and a general, but he suffered from leprosy. Naaman became a hero to his people when God gave the Arameans a military victory over Israel through him. How did that happen? Let's find out. As the battle began, Naaman randomly shot an arrow in the air. It struck and killed Ahab, the king of Israel, causing the Jewish troops to scatter and flee, giving the victory to Aram. So you, as you probably know, I mean, well, all this was ordained. This was all divine providence, but it's actually explained fully there in the Tanakh how Ahab, or Ahab, Ahab as we pronounce it, was, uh, there was a decree against him because of his persecution Um of one of, of one of his subjects from which he took his garden and he had him murdered. It was, it's a whole story there. So <clears throat> when God saw that, he, you know, there was a judgment against the king, a judgment of death. In any event, so, so King Ea, so Ahab is killed. And this all comes about through this non-Jewish king. So so again, we see the hand that there, there was, in fact, this is what we see in the Torah, that it says that um, we read in the, in, in Parashat Hazinu, in the song at the end of Deuteronomy, it says there that they'll say, how is it that, that uh, one pursued a thousand? How is it possible? In other words, that the, the victories that the, that the nations have will, over Israel will be miraculous. And they should think and realize that it's not because of them, but this is, this is a the punishment from God and they're the tool, they're the medium in which it's coming about. And this seems to be what happened here. He, uh, this was a miraculous thing. He shoots an arrow in the air and it kills and it kills the king. He wasn't even done on purpose. Okay. Around the same time, the Arameans had sent raiding parties into Israel. One of them captured a young Jewish girl who became a servant of Naaman's wife. So we had a Jewish girl, a uh, servant girl at home. When the girl saw that Naaman was a leper, she said to her mistress, my master should go to the prophet who is in Samaria and plead with him and he will cure him of his leprosy. Okay. 
Naaman came before the king of Aram and told him what the girl had said. The king answered, go, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel on your behalf. Naaman immediately prepared to travel to Israel, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 gold pieces, and 10 silk tunics. He took a, a treasure trove over there to, uh, I guess, as payment for the treatment. The letter from the king of Aram was delivered to the new king of Israel because the previous king was killed in the battle, right? So, so here are this man who represents an enemy of Israel who just killed the prior king of Israel is coming and saying that he's looking for a prophet. So obviously the king's reaction was fear and suspicion. Let's see. <clears throat> So again, the letter from the king of Aram was delivered to the new king of Israel. It read, Behold, I have sent my trusted servant, Naaman, to you, and you are to cure him of leprosy. Okay, so he's giving instruction to the king to do whatever he can to cure him of leprosy. <clears throat> so clearly you see from this letter that Aram is exercising a lot of influence over the kingdom of Israel. Because he was almost coercing him, said you have to cure, you have to Find a way to cure him. After reading the letter, the king of Israel tore his clothing and cried out, Do I have the power of God to put to death and to bring to life that this one sends a man to me to cure his leprosy? This was just a pretext to go to war against me. See, so that's how he understood it. He thought it was a pretext for war. He thought that this was some kind of a, a, a deceitful trick in order to create a, uh, a justification for war. Anyway, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had rent his garments, he sent word to the king saying, why have you torn your clothing? Let that man come to see me so he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So in other words, it seems that Elisha specifically wanted to see him in order to sanctify God's name and for this important person of the nation to realize the power of God. Next paragraph. And I'm on page 73. Thus Naaman came to the house of Elisha leaving his servants and companions at a distance and coming alone on horseback to Elisha. So Elisha is the prophet, he comes to the prophet. He stood at the doorway of his house and announced his presence. Elisha sent a messenger to him who told him, go and immerse yourself seven times in the river Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be healed. <clears throat> so he tells them to immerse seven times in the Jordan River and he'll be healed. Naaman was furious. <clears throat> he had come all that way with many attendants bearing precious gifts, and Elisha had not even spoken to him personally, but only through a servant. Naaman said, I imagine that he, that he would come out to see me, and he would call in the name of, of his God, and he would raise his hand and point his finger towards me and cure my, my leprosy. Are not Amana and Parpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Would I not become clean if I immerse myself in them? And he turned and went away in rage. So in other words, he also took this to mean, well, he took it as a disrespect. And basically, you know, he was expecting some type of, you know, kind of like spells. He was expecting some type of prayer, some type of, um, you know, um, incantation, I guess, or something. And instead, he was told to immerse in the water. He didn't understand the significance, and he figured, well, it's just water. I mean, what's, what's the big deal? So he was very, very angry about this. But his servants approached and spoke to him, saying, if the prophet had given you a difficult task to perform, would you not have done it? And yet, all he told you to do is immerse yourself in the river and become healed. Naaman realized the truth of their words and went and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh returned to flesh like a young boy's. He became pure. He was healed. Amazing. Unbelievable. Lucky man. To live in the time of the prophet. Wow. That was it. You wonder what was his uh, merit, Naaman, and that he merited this, being the general of a pagan king and an enemy of Israel. Here he comes over there and Elisha heals him. Amazing. I kind of feel like saying, oh, I wish I was there. Maybe he would have healed me. 
couple of things. Anyway, um, Ross, you want to make a comment? A couple of things. I think uh, the words of the prophet to the king send him here so that he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. It seems that that was kind of like a, a subliminal message or a side message to the king. Hey, did you forget about me? The king of Israel, like, should have sent him here to begin with. Yeah, yeah. And then, it's uh, kind of a tragic, it's a tragic thing that, well, I mean, the kings of Israel had a very poor relationship with the prophets of Israel. <laughs> So, you know, that might have been part of the reason why he didn't think of him. He, he may not have thought that Elisha would help him, considering that, well, Ahab's wife is the one who murdered the prophets. So, and he's, he's the successor. So the relationship between the prophets and the kings of Israel was, was pretty poor. So he may have thought, not even he may not have even considered asking him, but also, obviously, we see the tragedy of you know Jewish assimilation, so to speak, in which Jews don't even have sufficient respect for their own prophets and their own leaders. Instead, they're turning elsewhere. And that's what he's saying. Uh, hello, like you're saying, you have a prophet here in Israel. Where you were. <laughs> How come you don't have any respect for your own? There's no prophet here. You're looking, you're wondering, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So, but but we do see a repeating theme in several places that um, that God particularly wants to is concerned about the desecration of His name in front of the nations. And King Solomon says that when a non-Jew would come to the temple. God would always answer their prayers because a non-Jew won't understand why their prayers won't be answered and will walk away saying, oh, there's no God in Israel. While a Jew or an Israelite knows, well, if my prayers weren't answered, it's because, you know, I've sinned. That's because I wasn't worthy. I have to do, I have to repent. And because of that reason, the prayers of, of Jews were not always answered, but the prayers of the nations coming to visit uh, to the temple area were answered. So I think there's a similar theme here, despite whether or not Naaman was merited a miracle to happen to him, and I'm quite certain that he did not merit to have a miracle happen to him in the state that we see him in here. But um, nevertheless, in order to sanctify God's name, uh, this, this miracle took place. I mean, isn't that what Elisha said, that they should know that there's a God, there's a prophet in Israel? Let's see what let's see what the author says next. Naaman returned to the man of God, he and his entire entourage, and he stood before him and said, "Behold, now I know that there is no God in all earth except with Israel. And now, please accept this gift from your servant." And Elisha said, "As the Lord lives before whom I have stood, I will not accept it." Naaman pressured him to take the gift, but Elisha, Elisha refused. So he refuses to take the gift from Naaman. And Naaman said, then please permit your servant to be given a load of earth carried by a team of mules, for your servant will no longer offer up a burnt offering or any sacrifice to other deities, but only to the God of Israel. For one thing, may the Lord forgive your servant. When my master, the king, comes to Beth Rimon, to prostrate himself there, and he leans on my hand. I must prostrate myself in Beth Rimon alongside the king. May the Lord forgive your servant for this thing. Elisha answered him with his blessing and said, go in peace. So this is a very famous story um, in which a lot of lessons are learned about, about you know, the B'nai Noach in terms of their responsibility in relation to idolatry, things like that, because here we see a very interesting thing that um, the, the prophet permit, permitted, permitted Naaman to prostrate himself, which means really commit uh, a coerced form of idol worship. But because it was coerced, it was permitted. So this is where we see that a non-Jew is not obligated to give up his life um, 
for idolatry. Next paragraph. After Naaman had departed and traveled some distance away, Gehazi, the disciple and assistant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, my master has refused Naaman and the Aramean, but by not taking from his hand what he had brought as a gift. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. And Gehazi chased after Naaman. When Naaman saw Gehazi running after him, he stepped down from his chariot to greet him, asking, is all well? Gehazi answered, all is well. My master sent me saying, just this moment, two young disciples of the prophets have come to me from Mount Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two silk tunics. Naaman said, please take two talents. And he tied two talents of silver in sacks and two silk tunics and gave them to his servants who then gave them to Gehazi. Page 75. Gehazi went to a secret place and took the items from the servants' hands, hid them in his house, and then dismissed the servants. Afterwards, he came and stood before his master. Anyway, so it's well known that Elisha's uh, sexton here, his servant, uh, wasn't uh, so kosher, seems. Seems he was a little bit of a sneak, wasn't he? He, he uh, made this up and he got, he, he was an opportunist. He saw an opportunity to make a lot of money and he took it. You know, to, he may, I mean, to be fair, he may have said, why, why didn't my master, you know, we need the money. My master needs to fix his house. I mean, I don't know what excuses, justifications he may have had. I'm sure there were. Elisha was not a rich man. Um, but we see other examples in which we see that Elisha did not take from the community, like, or I could say, took very little. There's a famous story of the woman that he stayed at her house and she prepared a bed and, and a table with a candle. And if I remember correctly from the reading, so Alicia says, what is all this, this noise, this great, this, this, this great commotion you've done for us? I mean, a great commotion, it's a room, it's a candle. I mean, you think she did who knows what for him. He's a prophet. She, I mean, considering that, she didn't really do so much already. But I mean, I, she had a simple home. She had a humble dwelling. and she. But the way he describes it there, I don't know if you're familiar with that passage. And I don't remember the chapter. I don't know, maybe Ross help us out there. But um, what he says, uh, he says something to the effect of, you know, what is this all this commotion that you've done for us? How can I repay you? You know, basically, you get you clearly get the impression that he really was similar to Samuel and that he didn't accept, you know, gifts of wealth or money or stuff like that from the community. So same thing here from 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 Naaman. He didn't want to accept. Gehazi, on the other hand, you know, he uh, thought maybe he and his master can use a new a new set of robes, you know, and a uh, new set of sandals and some other stuff. And he said, "Now nah, I'm gonna." See if I can get some money out of this guy. Okay, so Elisha was not happy with this, obviously. So Elisha asked, "From where did you come, Gehazi?" And he answered, "Your servant has been nowhere special, just here and there." Elisha said to him, "Did my heart not follow you when the man descended from his chariot to greet you? Did you see this as your chance to take silver and precious garments and with them buy olive trees and vineyards and flocks and herds and servants and maid servants?" Now your reward shall be that Naaman's leprosy shall afflict you and your children forever. And Gehazi went away stricken with leprosy, white as snow. Wow, so we can learn a lot of uh, interesting things here. Um, it's, it's a hard, it seems like a harsh punishment or, or, or not. I mean, first of all, he was dishonest. I mean, he told Naaman something that was not true. He told him that there were disciples and there weren't any that, you know, that, that needed them asking. So he basically, he committed a fraudulent, he cheated, he lied. And what he took was really kind of a form of theft because if Naaman would have known there was no real cause and if he would have known that Elisha had not sanctioned this, he wouldn't have given him the money. You know, he really wasn't giving it for Gehazi's sake. He was giving it for Elisha's sake. And so by misrepresenting um, that Elisha had said such and such, basically, you know, he had cheated the man out of money, which basically is theft. <clears throat> so the punishment in this case for theft was, was, le was, lep was leprosy. Leprosy. So, 
Um, yeah, a lot of important lessons here. A lot of a lot of important lessons. Jacob has his hand up. Jacob. Hello, Rabbi. And everyone. Hi. Um um I had heard that uh leprosy uh, is commonly a punishment for Lashon Hara for slander. Right. Could it be connected uh possibly with with like uh kind of slandering God or like giving God a kind of like it looks bad like for the prophets to do? Hmm. Is that a stretch? Well, I mean, it's true that that he is here using his his um, um, it's through the power of speech that he's committing this this wrong. I mean, he's committing this transgression through his speech. So, in that way, it's, there's a connection. He's lying. Um, I mean, one thing about leprosy is that it's it's an outward sign of, of a sickness. I mean, obviously, but it's not something you can hide or pretend you don't have. It's something that everyone can see. And um, in that way, Gehazi went from someone who was deceitful and pretended to be a holy person or, and maybe charming in some extent into someone that would be repulsive to other people. Ross? I was just gonna say, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the term that is used to describe Naaman's condition is exactly the same term that was used to describe Miriam, what happened to her when she had spoken against Moses. Right. The, so the spelling is the same and the, uh, the definition is the same. It is a physical sign of a spiritual condition. It, that's the way I've always heard it explained. Yes. Uh, yes. David, David, did you have yes. something? No, no it's, uh, I think it's called Saras. Yes, yeah. that's right. correct. Jacob, did that help you at all? Yeah, definitely. And especially the idea of concealing something because a lot of, I mean, a lot of slander is kind of said behind people's back, you know, and this was said behind Elisha's back in a way. Right, right, 100%. There's a deceitful element in slander also, as, as it's often that people uh, smile to the person's face and then talk behind their back. So there is that element of it, that's true. <laughs> There is one other thing, if I may. Sure. Um, as far as the prophet, Elisha, the, the woman you were referring to was a Shunammite woman who had built him a room so he could stay because right. he was continually passing by. She was childless and uh, as a, a kindness to her for having done what she did, um, he told her that she would have a child, right? Which, which subsequently she did, and um, that child grew up to be a prophet. I'll I'll look up that prophet's name for you. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole there's a whole story about that child. The child is resurrected. The child dies and appears to be some kind of heat stroke or something in the field. And then he he's brought back to life. But but do you see that verse that I was talking about in which he said that what did you bring upon me this great commotion, this great did, did you notice that? All right, I'm anyway. Looking for it. In the, in Have a story. cook. It's in the story. I don't want to get bogged down on it. Okay. Rabbi, Rabbi, yeah. I have a quick question here. Uh, we've talked many times about the scripture that says the children shall not bear the sins of the father and vice versa. No, but yet no. here it says you and your children will be like this. So how do we, how do we reconcile that? Very good question. Very, very good question. And even though I could answer you, 
by saying that it's measure for measure, because Gehazi sought to, as the prophet said, he, he sought to uh, enrich himself and his children because his, his, his possessions would pass to his children and so forth, and then the punishment is both to him and his children. But it doesn't answer the problem because the problem is, is that despite that, the verses tell us that if the children are, are innocent, they, should, they can't be punished. Now, the truth is that um, this is a curse. It's not, it's not a punishment from God in the same sense of the word. So, and we don't know what the result was, if it did pass to the children or not. Generally speaking, um, because we also have another verse, Sandy, in which the verse says that he meets out the punishment of, um, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the wicked unto, for four generations. So there's a conflicting verse that says that God does punish. So does he punish children or he doesn't? And the answer the sages say is if they continuing in the father's ways, they are, can be punished for the sins of their fathers as well. So I think that's how we'd have to learn this verse that he meant to say that if your children are like you, and he assumed they would be because children generally follow in the, the past of, of their parents, but not always. And that's was the meaning. You and the, your children like you will all bear this sickness. Okay. Um, Ross puts in the, the, oh, sorry, Rabbi. In the chat. I thought I found the verse for you there. It's uh, 2 Kings 4.13. And uh, look, you have been concerned is actually hine uh, charadta. So like the same root as like haredi. Uh, yes, that's it. Interesting. So they translate it as a concern. But the literal meaning of it is, is, a, is a great, uh, you know, trembling. What is this great trembling that you brought upon? I always thought that it was, that was the meaning of it. And it, so it was just such an extreme expression. Um, but it seems like in the English, they translated it as this great, great concern you had. Okay, anyway, let's continue. Um, thank you, thank you, Jacob. Um, page 75, middle of the page, the Nauman program. The Bible's account of Naaman is more than a story with real people and historical events. It is an allegory that forms a pattern for every Noahide Garrett. Wow, so it's a paradigm. Every Garrett can see himself in Naaman, for every Garrett experiences a Naaman program. How so? The story of Naaman, the every Garrett, begins before we meet him in the Book of Kings. We do not see the beginning. The beginning takes place in heaven before Naaman is born begins with God choosing the soul of a gear and bringing it into the world. In this particular case, his soul is Naaman, who was born into idol worshiping family in Syria. It appears that Naaman is in the process of rejecting idolatry and choosing God. But the truth is that it is God who chooses Naaman because he knows that Naaman will choose God. It is a love story. Very, very interesting statement. So in a certain sense, I mean, I mean, everything is providence, but in a certain sense, he's saying that in the same, in a similar way that the children of Israel chosen as a nation, B'nai Noach converts are chosen individually. Powerful idea there, a very innovative, very, very fascinating idea. Now, does this take away from your great, you know, your efforts to come and join? No, I don't think that's what he's saying, but still, no, where did you get the strength from and the, and the inspiration and so on? This, this, you know, at the end of the day, there is a certain degree of the predestination involved in this. So. Okay, I think I'm going to stop over here and we're going to go to Path of the Righteous Gentile. We'll continue next time. More about that. Okay.
Any questions or comments before I move to a totally different subject? Um, Rabbi, just a quick few things. I mean, on Sandy's topic about the generational curses and stuff, like you said about um, if they continue in the, uh, it says there, if you carry on in the sin, then the sin will stop for the um, generation to, if they see their father do it and they carry on, then it carries on. But if it does, if they stop, then it doesn't carry on. Same as Abraham. Um, with his father and idol worship, he decided not to follow in his father's footsteps. So you can take that as a basic, basic example. And then there was other, I mean, there's curses up to 10 generations with um, when they stopped Moses from walking through their land. Uh, it was a different curse of not coming to the temple and offering idols in the book of Deuteronomy. They were allowed to come worship, but they weren't allowed up to the holy temple. Or Who is this? The tent in Deuteronomy. Which group of people are you referring to? Uh, just curses. I'm just talking about curses in general. Oh. That curses carry on if you carry on in your father's son and oh, on I idolatry. I see, I see. So are you disagreeing with me that it's for four generations? Are you saying that it goes for more? No, 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 no. I'm not. That's true. It can go up to four generations. No, I'm not disagreeing. That's right. But I'm pointing out, like you said, there's different, like that Sandy was saying about the, the Alicia's disciple that he got cursed for a different reason. That wasn't the same curse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's different curses and different things. That's why I, was, I brought up the curse of 10 generations that God uh, wouldn't allow <clears throat> um, certain nations to go up to the temple. That went up to 10 generations. Oh, it's interesting. The, the sages uh, learn that not to mean going up to the temple, but joining the Jewish people. I think you're referring to marrying into the children of Israel up to 10 generations. The Yeah, and, and partaking in the Passover. For Passover? It's one of the feasts. It's somewhere, it's in Deuteronomy. They weren't allowed to go up to a certain point. They weren't allowed to, they're allowed to sacrifice and stuff. They just weren't allowed to go to a certain point up to 10 generations. And there was no way out of that. Mm, okay, interesting. Where did you read that? Deuteronomy. I can't remember which passages. Well, that doesn't sound familiar. Haven't you read that? Maybe Remember, something because it doesn't sound familiar to me at all. They God stopped, uh, gave them that curse because they wouldn't offer Moses and the people in the wilderness to permit going through their land. Um, yeah, that's a reference not. to that's a reference to intermar intermarrying into the Jewish people. I don't okay. think. That maybe I'm wrong. It, you, you can send me a source later. I'm, I'm happy to concede if I'm wrong about something. All right. Maybe. Okay. Well, the, it's just up to generations. Maybe I'm misread for what reason. So, yeah. But you're bringing up a good point, too. Your point is that the idea that someone is not, that the actions of an individual um don't affect their offspring is not absolute at all there are acts that do affect offspring for example if a priest has a a, a relations with a woman he's forbidden to have relations with he disqualifies the children from being kohanim meaning from being priests that can um, do service in the temple so yes a person can affect his kids by his actions the same thing an illegitimate, you know, child, it's not his fault, but it's a reality of his situation. So we have certain cases, but it's just the difference is it's not punishment. 
it's the result of the original act that caused this to happen. Um, I think you have your your point though of, of the the Amabites. I think it's it's the Ammon and Moab that that are kept out of the Jewish people the longest. I think that's the ten generations there. Yes. Um, so because they didn't um, welcome them, they didn't uh, meet them with with bread Peace. and water and so on and so forth. Um, yes. So yeah, but that's that's a better question. That's you're making a good point. It sounds like that's some form of punishment. Um, there was no. It's not, really it's, a punishment. it's not exactly a punishment. It's it's um, the Torah seems to be telling us that the Jewish people from their end can't forget the way that this nation behaved. And they, they need they need to respond to it. Uh, in other words, they're doing it to be sensitive to the way their forefathers were treated. So also another approach is that they're just a people who have no um, hospitality. They have they don't have the trait of hospitality, and therefore that's something that you grow up with. You know, if you don't grow up with it, it's hard to get it. Not saying it's impossible, but these are kind of character traits that people learn in their homes and in their communities. And people that, that are not um, hospitable to others and welcoming them to their homes, it usually rubs off on the children. But anyway, it's, it's still, you know what, still in all, it's a good question. Good question. That, that seems to contradict the fundamental idea of um, that children shouldn't be punished for their parents. Okay. But again, I mean, it, it, technically it isn't the same. It's not, the point is we, that we're not taking a sin, judging it, and there's a ruling and there's a judgment and, we're, and to say that, oh, the person did this trans, transgression we're going to punish their children for it. So it's slightly different. This is kind of, a, uh, as I said before, has to do with national relations between the two peoples. And that the act uh, was an affront to the nation that, that, the, that later generations have to be sensitive to. So, okay. Rabbi, could it be um, that a child cannot lose its place in the world to come because of actions of its father. Maybe it suffers consequences in this life because of what a parent did, but it, if they do not persist in it, it will not affect their place in the world to come. Could that, could that factor in there? Well, It's an interesting point you're making. I mean, generally speaking, the written Torah doesn't discuss, um, doesn't certainly doesn't explicitly discuss um, the rewards or punishments of the world to come. So that would be very unusual. And also, I don't think it's a quoted by the sages that this is a proof of the world to come in that verse. Most punishments and rewards, for example, in, in the chapters of the Shema, you know, are talk about this world. So, general, it's a general rule, there are exceptions. I'll just put it that way. It's a general rule, there are some exceptions. Okay. Let's do a little bit of um, returning to God in the Righteous Gentile, path of righteous Gentile, before we have to stop. Okay, page 29. Top of the page. So again, we're talking about the matter of repentance. Changing one's ways from being having having remorse, changing one's ways, confessing the sin. Five, a Hasidic rabbi once happened upon a person who was a notorious sinner. 
the rebel walked up to the man and confessed that he was envious of him. But Rebbe, the man said in amazement, you are a saint and I am a sinner. Why should you be envious of me? Because the Rebbe answered, you can bring a much greater light into the world than I can. I can only bring goodness to the world by resisting sin and doing what I am supposed to do. You can conform thousands, maybe millions of evil deeds into wondrous merits by repenting and returning to God. It's a beautiful concept. Very, very, very beautiful idea. And, you know, that's why there's no reason why a person should get down about their past. Because their, bad, their past can be turned around. If the person turns, you know, repents and changes and pulls himself away from those actions, then, you know, it all can be turned into merits. And one of the, the most um, simple ways of understanding it is that this, the, it's those acts that made the person feel such terrible remorse and such a terrible feeling of distance that they yearn to grow ever closer to God in ways that the, the, the saintly person can't feel because he doesn't have that distance. You can only feel that, that loneliness and that thirst when you really are very far. So, but that level of thirst is a tremendous, tremendous positive, you know, um, energy being brought into the world. So in that fashion, he's turning what was a negative thing into a positive thing because he's turning the distance into a springboard of, of tremendous energy to grow close. Just like when a person you know, doesn't see a loved one for a very long time, the feelings are extremely powerful. And it's a similar thing here that the person realizing the distance they came to because they were so far away, you know, this is... Um, this can bring to a tremendous, tremendous energy of remorse and yearning and thirst to be close to God. I mean, there's a story in the Talmud about someone just like this, who he, his remorse and repentance was so strong that his soul left him. He was a, a notorious uh, um, womanizer, I guess you could say. He frequented, it says, every, every prostitute he could find and then one day, he did. He did. Uh, he repented, and his his uh, his spirit left his body. The repentance was so powerful. So, so that really brings out the point that that now that level of repentance a righteous person can't have, because that type of remorse, that type of yearning, is when the person goes really low. So obviously this also explains a lot of things maybe about our, our generation or other such generations or situations is that sometimes from the loneliness, we can see God's, God's amazing light. Some people wonder, how can the Messiah come now? So many people are atheists. So many people aren't keeping you know, uh, you know, the law as they should, so on and so forth. Well, how can the Messiah come now? But really, you could say maybe it's just the opposite. Because what is a greater show, showing of God's great enlightenment and spiritual radiance? If, if, he, if, he, if through his miracles, you know, people who are very far can return, doesn't that really show a revelation of his enlightenment in a much more powerful way? And if everyone on their own are already close? So... Um, let's not lose heart. It could still happen. Okay. All right. Nobody has their hand up. So I think maybe I'll go a little, I'll continue a little bit. Okay. Let's start part two, page 29. If a person has transgressed one or all of the seven Noahide commandments, either willfully or unintentionally, when he repents, he's obligated to confess verbally, specifying his sins before the God of kindness, blessed be he. So there's an obligation to make an actual verbal confession, not just to keep it in your mind. How should he confess? He should speak words to this effect. I beseech you, God, I have sinned unintentionally. Why I transgressed willingly. I have acted out of spite before you, and I have done such and such. I regret my actions, and I'm ashamed of them. I will not do such and such again. 
This is the essence of confession. Anyone who increases the content of his confession as upon it is praiseworthy. I think this is a quote from Maimonides in the laws of repentance there. So there's an emphasis, you know, there's a big emphasis in Judaism on acting and speaking. And we have this concept, which just so true, you know, is that our actions touch the heart. Very often people feel, I shouldn't do that. It's not sincere. I don't really mean it. But Judaism teaches this incredible twist, to that this, this unintuitive but yet truth that if you say it, if you do it, you become what you you become that. It leaves a tremendous impression on the person to do it, even if we're not fully there. When a person, that's why you know the prayers every day. There's the prayer book, and we, we say these um, just amazing and words of depth and piety and you know uh, um, praise and so on. And not all of us are up to it. But we still say it because just saying those words bring us closer to the concepts. It's worth doing. And um, the same in all the commandments, even if we're not fully there, we do it though. We become habituated, we become different people. To a great extent, we are what we do much more than what we think. If we think one thing, but we do something else, who are we? Aren't we really what we do? I mean, what's the point of saying it or even thinking it? But then we don't have, can't exert the self-control and we do something completely different. So anyway, but here we're talking in a good, in a good fashion is that the speech, the power of confessing, that speech is, is incredibly powerful and it's the active portion of the repentance because the refraining from sin is a bit inactive. You're just stopping yourself from doing the things you did before, which is really extremely powerful and not easy. Really, to a great extent, in my opinion, that's really the, the essence of teshuva is person not doing it again. And Maimonides does say that as well. He said a true bal teshuva is someone who comes in the same situation and refrains and restrains himself from doing what they did the last time. But nevertheless, there's a specific power of confession and that is a positive act. The person's doing something, even though it's words, or where you're saying something, your lips are moving, the body is engaged, your breath is, is involved, and you're, you're focused at least on the words to, you know, and um, so it's important. And obviously in the Yom Kippur prayer, we do it again and again and again. We, we confess many, many times to every sin on the Aleph bed, from Aleph until Taf there. So important. Okay, questions or comments? Okay, Ross. I kind of looked up what he was saying. It was uh, at the time when Moses and, and such were passing through on their way to the land. The Ammonites and Moabites, it claims, did not meet them with food and water. Right. So that was a prohibition against the men, the men only, because we know that Ruth was a Moabitess and that uh, I think uh, Rehoboam's uh, mother was an Ammonitis. Yeah, yeah. It actually was also this that's this question was only fully resolved uh around the time of King David. There was questions, there were there were those of their opinion that King David was illegitimate <laughs> because he wasn't even Jewish properly because of the rule that and his because his mother, well he's not his mother, but his mother's 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 mother was an Ammonite. Okay. <clears throat> uh, sorry, Rabbi, I've got a few questions quickly. Sure. Um, so I've got two questions. The first one is when God afflicts us with some form of punishment, we know it's something whether we need to look at ourselves, God wants to reveal something, this or that. But are they diseases and things that God don't put on us just as a natural cause or not him putting on us. We just get it. And it's a natural cause. There's nothing that God is trying to show us through the suffering and the pain. That sounds a little sadistic though, doesn't it? You have well, to, a, here's the thing. 
Your question implies that I can say it in a diplomatic or a more uh, objective fashion and say this, according to the opinions that, you know, there's a, okay, how do I say it? I'll say it this way. Okay. Your question is implying a little bit of a lack of providence. Now, there may be some opinions of some scholars that, you know, that God's providence is not necessarily involved in every aspect of everything. But, but I think generally for human beings, there's a pretty much a consensus that there is that this complete uh, direct providence while there's questions about for the animal kingdom and other things like that. But for individual human beings, there's divine providence. Now, our accepted tradition at this point is that, and, and, and following the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov is that there's providence, direct providence in everything even animals, even, even, even leaves falling to the ground. So, so then the question is, is there any time a person can get sick and it's not because of a punishment or something like that, or some kind of a means to help them spiritually? That's your question. Well, there is one situation in which that wouldn't be because of a spiritual thing. And that is a person's careless. In other words, if a person for some reason brought, brings the, the sickness upon themselves, if they go into a place where it's dangerous, where there's many sick people, or they take poor care of their health, it's sort of spiritual because God commands us to take care of ourselves. And if we don't take care of ourselves, and the natural result of that not taking care of ourselves is that we get sick, God may not protect us from that not happening if we don't you know, take care of ourselves. So, you know, I don't know if that helps at all, but I guess what I'm saying, the Talmud says that there's divine providence for everything except um, the common cold and things like that. So, and that's the basic idea is that if a person is not careful uh, with their health or it weakens themselves, then they can get sick. And that's, that's a natural re you know, result of their situation that they were their carelessness does that help at all um yes it does but like say now basically just i can give you example but it's let's say that someone god forbid gets cancer mm -hmm. and something maybe god wants him to repent before it takes him does something maybe it's just the way of the end of the life on this earth you can't get rid of it. Maybe he wants to bring up something, repent of it, become good with God again. And but they and sometimes maybe there isn't something, and it's just a natural form of cancer from bad genetics. Could it be that? My personal opinion is no. Unless, unless it's a form of punishment. In other words. If the person didn't believe, and the person thinks that everything is according to nature, then the measure for measure is that God behaves with him according to nature. You know, I mean, but there's always some providence and some judgment. There's, there's no just, God just puts it on autopilot. You know, I, at least I don't believe that that's the case. All right. Okay, so that's clear. And then the next question I wanted to, to ask you, when you, let's say uh, we, we don't have access to this stuff all the time, these lectures, these, and all you have to wait till two, three o'clock in the morning and once a week, but you want to learn and learn. And you're looking for a decent grabber online, on YouTube or whatever. How can you make sure he's kosher just by watching a video? Oh, that's so just... he doesn't lead you stray or he's saying something funny. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, that's a tough one. I mean, I guess you'd have to look at look at the person up reviews and see if he's been criticized, ask around. Um, you know, it, that's a that's a tough one, but I personally am more into books than 
But I mean, everyone according to their nature, some people need to hear life. The truth is it is tough to just sit with a book all the time if, if you don't have a study partner. But it would be good to find a study partner, even mm -hmm. if it's over the internet, if you can't find the rabbi, but come together as one or two people or as a community and, and just study you know, certain text together. That's, that's a legitimate text. And then, you know, you're putting in a lot more effort into your studying when you have to work through it yourself. I always used to have a problem with lectures because my mind sometimes would get stuck on a certain thing they said and like, wait, what does that mean? And then before I turned around, he was like five steps ahead and I already lost him. You know? <laughs> so I'm, and I'm sure that may be happening to some people during my lectures too. I mean, I could understand that. But um, nowadays you can press rewind and re-listen and, you know, I wasn't the greatest listener. I like, I like books because of that. You can always reread it and you read it again, you know, and, and focus on the words very carefully. And in Jewish study, like Talmudic study, the text has become really the, the source, like your ability to read the text and extrapolate its meanings and its implications and inferences has become you know, the Talmudic skill, not so much lectures, you know, lecture is more, Sorry, Rob. you know, should I say it? I'll I mean, get to more spoon feeding, I, I mean, a little bit more, somebody's telling you stuff, you know, it's harder to take that book out and, and break it open and knock your head against it and try to figure out what it's saying in there. But it's good for a person's head to do that. So I, und I understand what you're saying, but then again, it does. It still doesn't get away from the, the answer whether you watch someone's lecture and you read someone's book because that person is writing a book on their opinions. I'm not talking about the Talmud now. I'm talking about someone's opinions. How do you, how do you think his references up? Remember, I don't understand Hebrew like you do. I can't go into the original Hebrew book and see, oh, is this guy now saying what the Hebrews say? So I, Ross did give me a contact and they're very good, but I got a lot of time to study. I mean, I just use what I have now as references, you know, the normal English Bible. I don't go into the Old Testament, but but there's a lot in the New, sorry, I don't go in the New Testament. I go in the Old Testament and it's there's not much wrong there. It still gives you the basic lifestyles and the stories. I know a lot of us been corrupted. But you see what I'm saying? Well, yeah, I really wouldn't actually, I mean, I really wouldn't advise you to, to be studying from that because a lot of it is inaccurate. If you get, you should try to get a Hebrew Bible. I mean, there's one from the, what is it, Judaica Press or Art Scroll or something else because there's a lot of mistakes there and a lot of things that they were changed by Christian censors to fit with the Christian story. And I really highly advise you to get another one. Like I said, yes, no, I will do that. What? Anyway, I will do that. Um, I will do that. Let me let me just say to the, to everybody who's here who doesn't know. First of all, there's something called Safaria, in which you can get online like so many Jewish books. The translations are aren't, aren't always so easy, but. But Sepharia is an, an online digital library of traditional Jewish materials. You know, from everything from the Tanakh, from the Hebrew Bible, through the Talmud, Midrash, Zohar, um, Code of Jewish Law, you name it, they got it. So, I mean, that's, that's a place to go. So there's no, there's really no reason for anyone to, for you to say, I can't get, if you have a computer and you have internet, then you can go there and look it up and it's, it's all translated to English. So uh, if you don't understand English, that's a little bit more difficult and it's hard. I don't know if Safari is in other languages, but uh, it is in English. So that's, that's one place you can go. Chabad.org is another good place. And yeah, and the TV. Why are we selling the TV? There's so many videos on the TV. You can always access anytime you want. So what's the problem? They have an archive and you just go there. You can even, you know, 
You can even see Rabbi Weissman over there. I think they have a couple of my lectures. Should I do a little self-promotion right now? I guess I just did. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Salma. Um, all right. So, but it's a tough question you're asking, just generally in terms of how to find leadership and, and how to know who to, you know, who to follow in terms of Jewish uh, lectures. You know, but the thing is, I would focus on, first of all, Noahide lectures directed to the Noahide, B'nai Noah community. Um, and then, you know, go to respected, uh, you know, if you, in other words, like they said, if you, know, if you, if you, um, if they're respected, accepted organizations, then you can basically accept that the rabbis they, they host are the same, you know. Um, it's also harder for a Ben Noah to really mess up because, I mean, I guess there may be some, some people out there who may be misinforming Noahides too, I guess, but the point is, um, if the guy tells you it's talking about, you know, Shabbos, it's not going to affect you if he tells you the wrong thing or, you know, it, things like that. It's a lot. I mean, it's, it's a lot. How do I say it? You have to say something pretty darn really wrong, really heretical to get you into any trouble. It has to be pretty serious to really make a big problem. But Again, I'm not, I'm just not really into like just random, for example, there's some rabbis online that they mix politics with Torah and current events and stuff like that. I mean, I guess it's okay, but it's mostly like a little bit entertainment, a little bit. I mean, it's not really deep study. You know, if you say, if you want to really hit the books of B'nai Noah Judaism, that's not really the place to go. All right, anyway, um, that's pretty much, we it but yet um maybe we'll read one more paragraph so that we continue studying torah and finishing on a uh you know finishing a little just make a little bit more progress okay so let's do paragraph two here in part two on page 29 a punishment imposed on a person by a no high court or law serves as an atonement for the transgression if the person confesses his sins to god in the above manner Similarly, if one injures a friend or causes him monetary loss, even if he has paid back what he owes, he has not atoned for his transgression until he confesses to God and resolves never to repeat such a deed again. So even in the case of, of, of between man and man, confession is still required. And it's teaching you an important point there that punishment through a Beit Din, through a Jewish court, that's meted out as a punishment for transgression of one of the Noahide laws, or even a, a, a Noahide court, brings an atonement to the person, as long as they confess to the sin. Okay, I guess we're gonna stop over here, but just shows you the importance of confession, that even though the person is, it was, is punished by the courts, and even though the person compensated the other Jew or Noahide, whoever it may be, and return their possessions, not good enough until the confession takes place. It's just to show how important of a um, component confession is to teshuva, to repentance. All right, everyone. That's it for tonight. And may Hashem lead us from strength to strength.